Okay, welcome to the wonderful world of Sanger sequencing. So this kind of assumes that you know about the Human Genome Project and that it mapped all the base sequences of the entire number of chromosomes of humans. A uh, big international project. And one of the early techniques that was worked out by Mr. Sanger, which is why it's called Sanger sequencing, um, they don't use it so much anymore, we've got better, faster techniques now, but you do need to know about Sanger sequencing, it's sort of a classic technique for mapping um, base sequences. So, um, we're obviously talking about DNA, and so if we imagine that we've got a piece of DNA, and obviously we don't know the sequence of this DNA, so we imagine we've got a piece of DNA and it has a three prime end obviously and a five prime end and its base sequence is TAT GCG CAC AAT If we then replicated that DNA, and I'm going to use yellow, I'm not sure how well it will show up, but I've got a new Sharpie yellow pen, so I'm going to use it. Um, in DNA replication, what would happen to that strand of DNA is it would replicate into A, T, A, G, C, sorry, C, G, C, G, T, G, T, T, A, going again from the 5 prime to the 3 prime direction, remembering that's the way in which DNA replication, so the bases are added one at a time, an A will be added first, followed by a T, followed by a A, <laughs> followed by a C, followed by a G, followed by a C, followed by a G, followed by a T, followed by a G, followed by a T, followed by a T, followed by an A. So they will be added on one at a time. Now what Sanger did was he said, right, okay, um, if I could stop that after some of those bases, I could probably then sort out the different lengths of fragments. So what he did was he, um, he used something called a dideoxynucleotide. So all this is, um, is an altered nucleotide that will not then allow the addition of another base. And you can make them in the four bases. So we could make um, a dideoxynucleotides by removing bits off an A. We could make... Uh, T dideoxynucleotides. We can make C dideoxynucleotides. And we can make G dideoxynucleotides. And what that will do is if the base that attaches to the template strand is an altered one, it will stop the DNA replication at that point. So effectively, when they're doing Sanger sequencing, they're going to set up four different tubes. They'll have a tube with, an, with A dideoxynucleotides in, with T, with C and with G. Now obviously they need some ordinary nucleotides as well, because you don't want to always, if you're adding in, if there were all A dideoxynucleotides, that replication would always stop at that first point. And that would only tell you what base number one was. So you really want it to stop randomly at wherever the bases are and get a mixture of different lengths that tells you where all of the A's are on your strand. Now obviously they're doing this for hundreds of bases and I'm doing it for 12 just as an illustration and I've picked 12 um, to match with the little poppy bead activity that you did. 
So these dideoxynucleotides, what's their role? They stop the elongation. And these are our four types that we've got available. So, what we're going to do is we're going to stick our template strand and so we're going to need a template, we're going to need some DNA polymerase. The template strands are quite easy to make, you can just sort of denature the, uh, break the hydrogen bonds with heat. Some DNA polymerase, some nucleotides and one type of dideoxy. Uh, nucleotide. I bet there's a really clever abbreviation for that. Anyway, um, and you're going to need to set up four different tubes, one for A's, one for T's, one for C's, one for G's. So let's look at then the fragments that we're going to get from our sequence. Um, I'm wondering if I can fit them on on a probably can. So In tube one, I'm going to stick in my A didioxynucleotides. So tube one has got A didioxynucleotides in. And Remembering that my complementary base sequence is A, T, A, G, C, G, C, G, T, G, T, T, A. What I'm going to get in that tube is ones where the first base that it's added on to that T template has been a dideoxynucleotide and that will give me a fragment that is just an A. If it, the first one isn't a dideoxynucleotide, it's an ordinary one, it will carry on to elongate onto the T. If the next A that joins on is a dideoxynucleotide, it will stop there and we'll get an ATA. If the first one's okay, and the second one's OK, we'll get ATA, CGC, GTG, TTA. And it doesn't matter if it stops there, that's the end of our sequence. In tube 2, so this is where I'm going to put in my T didioxynucleotides. So now I'm going to get my A's will all be okay. If the first T that attaches is a didioxynucleotide, the replication stops there. Then we'll get A, T, A, C, G, C, G, O, T. If that's a didioxynucleotide, that's where that replication will stop. Then we get a, T, A, C, G, C, G, T, G, T. A, T, A, C, G, C, G, T, G, T, T. And of course, if none of them are didioxynucleotides that attach, we'll get the full length of the sequence again. So, I think you're probably uh, starting to get the picture now. So, in tube four, tube three, sorry, I'm going to put my C's. So, ATAs are all normal, and I'll get a C. 
next tube, A, T, A, C, G, and it might stop there. Then I've got A, T, A, C, G, C, G, T, G, T, T, A, and of course all of those are the nucleotides the G's, the T's and the A's, they're all absolutely fine, they're not the dideoxynucleotides, so it won't stop. And last but not least, we'll just, uh, for the sake of completeness, do tube 4 with our G dideoxynucleotide and DNA replication take place, um, we'll get it could stop there if that's a dideoxynucleotide. It could stop there if that one happens to be a dideoxynucleotide. It could stop there. Or, of course, it might not stop. I do realise that I've run off the end of the page here. I'm not going to worry about that because I'm going to do this look. Whoa! So those are all the fragments um, that I've got. So <clears throat> we've got fragments that are one base long, fragments that are three bases long, fragments that are 12 in tube one. In tube two we've got fragments that are two bases long, eight bases long, 10 bases long, 11 bases long and 12 bases long. In tube 3 we've got fragments that are 4 bases long, 6 bases long and 12 bases long. And in tube 4 we've got ones that are 5 bases long, 7 bases long, 9 bases long and 12 bases long. And that should obviously, because we've stopped it at all the possible points along, we should have all the numbers 1 to 12. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, and then we've got the 12s in each one. But of course you can't see that, so we now need a way of separating them by length. Um, ooh, 12 minutes, okay. I think I'll do it now for the sake of completeness. So, uh, I will do a separate video, I think, on gel electrophoresis. But effectively, this is a way of separating these fragments out by size. And it works on the basis that our fragments will move through a gel. So, we're going to set up a gel with four little wells. We're going to put the contents of tube one into there. Tube two, which is red, that was our T bases. So these are our A bases, A dideoxynucleotides, T dideoxynucleotide fragments, uh, C dideoxynucleotide fragments and G dideoxynucleotide fragments. Now effectively the shorter the fragment the further it's going to go. So because all of our lovely um, fragments, because if, you, if they don't randomly attach a dideoxynucleotide and it doesn't stop it, they will all have a 12 base line and these actually show up um, with dyes so they'll all have a line representing 12 bases so all of those 12 and they've got 11 I'm hoping I've left enough room now. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. So, 
Remember, in tube 1, in addition to fragment 12, we'd also got a fragment that would go as far as 3, and a fragment that's only one base long, and would go all the way up. So, fragment 3, 3 bases, and one that goes all the way up, because it's only got one nucleotide. In tube 2, we've got fragments 12 and 11 and 10 and 8 and it's going over to the other side and 2. In tube C we've got fragments that are four bases long. Well, that's right up there. And we've got fragments that are six spaces long, as well as our 12. And in tube 4, we've got 5, 7 and 9. So our very shortest fragment, so this is the first place that it has been stopped, is in the A zone. So our first base is going to be A. It's then stopped at a T. It's then stopped at an A. It's then stopped at a C. It's then stopped at a G. It's then stopped at a C. It's then stopped at a G again. It's then stopped at a T then a G, then a T, then a T, and then our last base, of course, is A. So even though we've all got all of our 12 fragments, so it's going to read that. And you will notice that ATA, this is what we started with, CGC, GTG, TT. Fabulous. We've managed to work out the whole sequence. Now, what they tend to do is do uh, absorption peaks of the dyes. So actually what you would see would be a set of peaks that would go like that and you would just read it. Off. So they're giving each one a different f fluorescence. So you'd actually get these beautifully coloured graphs to read off. Like that. So, there you have it, Sanger sequencing. Um, I can't help but think it must have been quite boring to do Sanger sequencing if uh, all you were doing was looking at little coloured graphs the whole time. But quite, you know, quite an important technique, clearly. Okay, I think that's it.